Hi everyone, let's talk about one of the most important theorems in statistics, the central limit theorem. And in order for us to really understand and appreciate this theorem, we are going to perform simulation. So what is the central limit theorem? If we are given a data set with a known distribution, that distribution could be highly skewed like this graph, or it could be a binomial distribution with two answers, a yes or a no, in favor or not in favor. Or that distribution could be flat like this. It could also be a uniform distribution. Or it could be just any random distribution. The shape of the distribution does not matter. The central limit theorem says that if we take samples from those random distribution, the sampling distribution of the sample means will approximate the normal distribution. What does this mean? Let's say we are given this graph of used cars. In the horizontal axis are the prices of the used cars, and in the vertical axis are the frequencies. Just by looking at the shape of this distribution, we know that the distribution is not normal. Now, if we take samples from this population, let's say we have here thousands of data points for used cars, and we take a sample of, let's say, 30, and we take this sample randomly. This sample size of, let's say, 30 has its own mean, and if we take some more random samples, and some more random samples, and a lot more of random samples, each of the samples with a size of 30 that we took randomly from the population has its own mean. Some means are higher, some means are lesser. There is variation in the values of the means that you are going to get here. But if you are going to graph the histogram of those means, the surprising effect, which is now what we call as the central limit theorem, is that the distribution of the sample means would approximate a normal distribution. This is very important. We have completely skewed distribution at the left, we took samples and we graph the histogram of each of the average of the samples. And when we graph the means of those samples, the distribution would be approaching the normal distribution. And that is the heart and soul of this central limit theorem. Because no matter what the distribution is, when we take samples randomly and compute the means of those samples, and look at the distribution of those sample means, the surprising result is that the distribution of those sample means would follow a normal distribution. And that is a very, very important discovery in statistics. And since the graph approaches the normal distribution, we know how to compute this function. In the previous video, we already talked about how we derive this function for the normal curve. And if this distribution now at the right follows the normal distribution, then we have a function that we can use to compute mathematically the probability of seemingly random events because of this theorem, which we call as the central limit theorem. The same is true with this other distribution. The sampling distribution of its sample means would also follow a normal distribution. And the same with this other distribution. So at this point, we are going to perform simulation, and I'm going to show you how we generate this graph at the right from these data points at the left. So let's go to our studio. So for our first data set in this simulation, we are going to talk about used cars. And our data set is composed of 5,000 observations and five variables. The variable that we are interested in is the price of the used cars. So let's check first the summary statistics. So the minimum value is zero. The median price is 2,990. The average price is 5,684. And the maximum price is 75,600. Now let's construct a histogram so we can see the distribution of the used cars. So here is now the graph of the 5,000 used cars. And let's look at the range of prices of these cars. So the prices range from zero up to $75,600. So some cars are being given away, but there are cars that are worth more than some brand new cars. And this line is the average of 5,648.026. Now at this point, let me take a sample of 30, meaning I'm going to randomly select 30 cars, and I'm going to do that k times. My k is two, so I'm going to do it twice. Let's see how the graph look like. So I took two samples. These are the means of those two samples. Now let me increase 
the number of repetition. Instead of taking only two samples, let me take 10 samples. And each repetition consists of 30 samples. So our sample size is 30, and we are going to take 10 of size 30. We are going to measure the average, and let's see the distribution of those averages. So here is now the result. Now let me increase the number of samples instead of getting only 10 repetitions, and let's see what happens. So here, we took 100 repetitions, and in each repetition, there are 30 used cars. Then, let's increase the number of repetition to 1,000. And in each repetition, we are going to take 30 used cars. Let's look at the distribution. Notice now that we are approximating this normal curve with a mean of 5,684.26 and a standard deviation of 7,571.79 over the square root of our n. Here, our n is 30. Then, let's increase the number of repetition. From 1,000, let's make it 10,000. And let's look at the distribution. Again, we are approximating the normal curve. Then, from 10,000, let's make it 100,000. And notice that there's nothing much that changed from 10,000 to 100,000. This part of the simulation is not yet the central limit theorem. What we are doing here is what we call as the law of large numbers. If we repeat the experiment over and over up to infinity, then the result that we are getting would be approaching the true distribution of our population. But the central limit theorem says that if we increase the number of samples, in this case, if we increase the value of n from, let's say, 30, let's make it 50, notice what happens to the graph. The graph becomes narrower. If instead of 50, we are going to change it with 100. Let's see what happens to the graph. Notice now that the white spaces between the histogram and the normal curve are now filled up, but there are still values here that are outside, and there are still white spaces inside this normal curve. So let's increase the number of n. Let's make our n 500, meaning our sample size is 500. And let's see what happens to the graph. Notice now that the graph is almost the same as the curve, and notice also that the spread is becoming narrower from before from about 2,000 to 10,000. Now the spread is from about 5,000 to 7,000. And that improves our estimate because we are now estimating the price of the cars taken randomly to be only between 5,000 to about 7,000. Now as we increase the number of N from 500, let's make this 1,000. So you can imagine now that you are conducting a study with a sample size of 1,000. You are going to interview 1,000 respondents, for example. Let's see what happens to the distribution. The graph now becomes narrower, and the histogram can now approximate the normal curve. That is now what we call as the central limit theorem. If we increase the sample size, in this case, the value of n, then the sampling distribution of the sample means approaches the normal distribution. And because of that, we can use our knowledge of the normal curve in order to compute probabilities, construct confidence intervals, and perform hypothesis testing. In our next data set, we are going to talk about education. We are going to know what is the highest educational attainment of our respondents. And the educational attainment is coded as numbers. So let's look at the distribution of our population. So this represents the educational attainment of our respondents. Notice that at grade 9, many students just reach grade 9 and then they stop before going to grade 10. Also, after grade 10, a lot of students already stop going to school. And then those who persevere to finish high school, they enrolled in first year college and then a significant number dropped out after first year in college, and then after second year in college, and only this much managed to reach graduation. And for our summary statistics, the minimum is 1, the first quartile is grade 9, the median is grade 10, the average is 10.08, the third quartile is grade 12, and the maximum is 16, or college graduate. You notice that our distribution has some bumps. There is a bump here at grade 9, meaning many students just entered high school but dropped out after one year in high school. 
And there is a bump also here in first year college. Now let's take a random samples. Let's say instead of taking 30 random samples, we just take 10 samples and our K value is 10,000. Let's see what happens to the distribution. Notice that it resembles some curve, but the normal curve is not pronounced. If we let n be equal to 20, let's see the distribution. Notice now that you can see some pattern similar to that of a normal curve. If we increase the sample size to 30, notice now that the curve is looking much better, similar to a normal curve. If we make this 50, our n is 50, the sample size is 50, we now have a much better approximation of the normal curve. And if we let n to be 100, so you can think of conducting a study and you have 100 respondents for your study. So the sampling distribution of the sample means now look like this. It's narrower compared to when the sample size is 30 or 50. But if you increase your sample to, let's say 200, look at the blue graph and see what change. So you now have a narrower distribution. The variance is smaller. If we increase from 200 to 400, which is around the sample size of many surveys, notice now that we have this neat looking histogram that resemble the shape of a normal distribution. And also if we increase the sample size to 1000, notice now that our variance becomes smaller and our curve is thinner. And since this is random, if you do the same sampling, the distribution might change slightly, but the shape remains. Notice that the distribution keeps on changing, but at that level, n equals 1000, the variance stays the same, the mean stays at the middle, only the little distributions here change. And if I tweak my program here, if I change the break to a bigger number, let's say 100, I can make the graph more smooth because the range now of each bar is smaller. And you can see that the normal curve, which is the red curve, and the histogram now resemble with each other. So what do we learn from our simulation? In order for the central limit theorem to work, here are the assumptions. Number one, the data must follow the randomization condition. The samples must be taken randomly. The second assumption is that samples should be independent of each other. Samples should not influence the other samples. And the way to do that is to sample with replacement. But if we sample without replacement, the sample size should not be more than 10% of the population. Because if you took 10% of the population, for sure, you are affecting the succeeding samples because 10% will significantly change the remaining 90%. And when you take samples from the remaining 90%, that would now be different than the population. And so independence can no longer be warranted. The other assumption is that the sample size should be sufficiently large. When the population is skewed or asymmetric, the sample size should be large. If the population is symmetric, small sample size will work. And here are the conclusions that we can make from the central limit theorem. Number one, the distribution of sample means x bar will, as the sample size increases, approach a normal distribution. And that is what we have been showing in our simulation. As the value of n increases, that means the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution. The other conclusion is that the mean of the sample means will be the population mean. That means we are confident that whatever is the mean that we get from our samples, that is a good approximation of the mean of the population that we do not know. Because in real life research, we do not know the mean of the population, but we can compute the mean of the sample. And the central limit theorem says that the mean that we computed from the sample is a good estimate of the mean of the population because as the sample size increases up to infinity, then the mean of the sample means is equal to the mean of the population. And another conclusion is that the standard deviation of the sample means will approach sigma over square root of n. We can now compute the standard deviation of the population if we know the standard deviation of the sample using this formula and vice versa. In practice, for sample size n larger than 30, 
The distribution of the sample means can be approximated reasonably well by a normal distribution. If the distribution of the population is almost normal, then a much smaller sample size will work. But if the distribution of the population is completely random, then we need higher value for n. That means a bigger sample size in order for the CLT to work. So let's look at some application. Let's go back to our used car data set. In that data set, our population mean is 5,684. That is the average price of the used cars. And the standard deviation of the population is 7,571. If 30 cars are taken randomly, what is the probability that their mean is letter A, greater than $6,000, letter B, between $5,000 to $5,500, and letter C, less than $3,000? Let's go to Desmos graphing calculator. So in, in Desmos graphing calculator, we go to function, we go to normal distribution, and there are two parameters that we are going to put here. Number one is the mean. So the mean of the population is 5,684.26, and the standard deviation is sigma over square root of n. So our sigma value was 7,571.79, and our n value is 30. So we have this sigma over the square root of n. And we now have this normal curve. In order to find the cumulative probability, we want to find a value that is greater than 6,000. So that means our minimum value should be 6,000 and our maximum value is up to infinity. So our answer for letter A is 40.96%. For letter B, between 5,000 and 5,500. So for letter B, we are going to change this with 5,000 as the minimum and the maximum is 5,500, and we now get a probability of 13.66%. And for the last example, what is the probability that the mean is less than $3,000? So less than 3,000, that means the minimum is infinity, and the maximum is 3,000. You can also put zero here, it's also the same. And the probability now is 2.6%. So that's the beauty of this central limit theorem, because we can compute precisely mathematically what's the probability value because we know very well the distribution of this normal curve. The area under this curve is 1, and whatever value we get here is the percentage of probability that the event happens. So thank you, thank you very much, and we hope to see you again in our next video.